Welcome to another episode of King's World. Okay, folks, I've been promising you this interview and nobody's gotten this guy. I'm the first one to get him. And I'm telling you right now, this is gonna be one of the best interviews that you ever heard. So let me give you a little background on who I'm going to interview. This man right here was the man that was solely responsible for me getting my pro card. Um, everyone knows my background, knows my story. Uh, they all know that Amin is the one who helped me at the very beginning. He taught me all the ins and outs of contest prep and what I need to do. But to get me past that bump, past that mountain called the NPC and into the IFBB, I hooked up with this man, Mr. Chad Nichols. And at that particular time in history, there were no gurus, there were no coaches, there was no internet nonsense and bull. There was only one man, and it was Chad Nichols. And I was blessed enough and lucky enough and honored to, to be part of his team. And honestly, it's because I had the balls to go up to him and, <laughs> and introduce myself and say, hey man, this is who I am, and if you think I got the goods, I would really love for you to help me and bestow me some of that Jedi knowledge so I can take it to that next level. So, without further saying, this is it, the man. Welcome, Mr. Chad Nichols. What's up, brother? Hey, King. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on the Chiefs, man. Awesome game, man. I was a little yeah. worried for you in that third or fourth quarter, but... I was a little worried. Dude, the last three hit, games man. I've been worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a great game. Congratulations on that. Great game, man. Okay, yeah. um, let's, get, let's just dive right into this, Chad, because um, a lot of people have, have done interviews, and you know how it is now, and I don't like to bring up other people's names or other shows or what have you. You know, a lot of things are now, everything I think is politically correct, or people try to take it too far as far as trying to be controversial. You know, we're not right. going to do that. We're going to go straight to the to the, the, the horse's mouth. We're going to go straight to the roots, and we're going to break everything down as is. Um truth style my style and your style you know how we do it okay yeah. chad tell a little bit about these kids who don't know give them a little bit about your background story who are you where are you raised where do you live and all that stuff i'll tell you what it's kind of a story because i actually started out just in a small town in illinois actually a little town called maliqua about 1800 people there um but then i moved to decatur which is basically centralized in uh, illinois and became a cop and i was a cop for five years and um loved it loved being a cop i was actually very damn good at being a cop um and at that same time i got into working out got into training me and kim um got together and so it was kind of interesting because originally I had decided like my goal was to obviously be a career cop and I wanted to learn more about nutrition, health and fitness, those types of things, because I seen that there was an opportunity in the wellness industry through our, through the police department. Right. Um, and so that was kind of the direction I went. And when I went that direction, it was right about the same time that Kim's career was taking off. And so I decided that I was going to get a year's leave of absence and just see what this whole bodybuilding thing was about. Kim had only been training for a very short period of time, but she progressed through, the, through it so quickly. Um, and so it was kind of a learning curve for all of us. We were kind of learning the bodybuilding lingo and how all this stuff kind of, you know, took because we literally knew nothing, I, like literally nothing. I remember the first contest she did. Um, it was like we had no clue what was going on. She had her top upside down, and I mean, it was just crazy, right? <laughs> and and so we're going through all of this, and everything took off very quickly. And I realized that there was a tremendous amount of opportunity, right, to be had within this industry, right. And I'll never forget, like I literally, this is the honest to god truth. So I went, um, I took the year's leave of absence, and I was supposed to come back to the police department. And I went in and I talked to my sergeant, and I said, listen. Um, I, I'm not going to come back. I'm not going to come back. I'm, I think I'm going to try to become a nutritionist. And the, and he's like, what? He's like, and I go up with athletes. I, I'm like, I, I think that's the direction I want to go. I, I feel like there's money to be made within this industry. And he's like, well, like, what do they make? And I go, right now, nothing. Right. <laughs> they don't make anything. And he's like, so you're going to give up a career for something that pays you nothing. You're right. an idiot. You are an effing idiot. And I go, 
I just feel like there's something there. I feel like well, there's something there. Did you there. have an athletic background? Like, did you play football, baseball? What did you do? I, honestly, I was a motocross kid. I was a BMX um, motocross kid. So I, I had no bodybuilding background. Wow. Like, that's... I was, you know, the kid that wanted to go fast. I was a BMX kid, a motocross kid. Like, that was what I was driven to. Um so it was, like I say, when I say it was a learning experience, it was a learning experience. But, the, but the, like, the I don't into the, the thing that I got from you when I first met you was the fact, exactly what you're saying right now, is the fact that you were a sponge. You wanted to get, just get as much as you can from everybody. Exactly. And that's, the, that's how I saw you at the very beginning. I was like, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So this is what I did. So I, I went and I, I had access to a couple of very, very smart guys that were doctors, and they gave me access to some medical libraries through their passcodes and stuff. Nice. And for the next several years, that's all I did. I spent the next several years literally just embedded in every possible thing. And like there was things that didn't pertain anything to bodybuilding but there was a way to kind of intertwine it right. and when i was like researching certain things and stumbled on to like all of the like malaria and then it came into quinine sulfate and like all of this stuff and i'm like holy shit there's like you just never know where you can kind of intertwine bodybuilding into this stuff so i literally just went every direction spider webbed out every possible way went as much as we could and deep, like dug deep, deep, deep as far as I could into stuff trying to just take in knowledge because basically textbook doesn't give you anything right. on bodybuilding. No, it, it will teach you how the body works. It will teach you how things work. Mm -hmm. But when you are talking about a bodybuilder, it completely is out the door, right. like completely out the door. Because if it was textbook, everybody would look like a freak, exactly. but it's not textbook. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you have to be able to figure out how to take some of that and apply it. And that's what I feel like, listen, was I the smartest guy out there? I don't think so. I don't think I was the smartest guy out there. But what I had the ability to do is to use common sense. I had the ability to absorb everything that I possibly took in and utilize it in a fashion that basically benefited each individual person. And I think that's the key is people try to either become too you know, they're, everybody's looking for something that's crazy, right. that seems over the top. Right. That And most of the stuff, when you start to simplify everything and apply it to common sense, which I know is a tough word in bodybuilding, right. it's used, it, 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 you, basically you start to see the big picture. You start to see everything. And I think that's what allowed me to basically start handpicking things. And then, you know, when I got to certain athletes, then I really got to see, you know, just how in depth everything could go, how far this could possibly go. Now, how as far, far as did you take it with, uh, how far did you take it with Kim? Like what, what was the first show you and Kim did together? So me, actually I competed, I competed in a show and then Kim just went with me to watch. Right. And we, and she had not even lifted a weight. So she hadn't started working out yet. Um, she went to a show and she was like, you know, I think I could do this. And uh, so we literally bought her the next show. So I had a show that I was going to do the following week. Mm. We bought her a posing suit. She did uh, the show. And like I said earlier, we literally had the top on, on upside down. I had no idea what we're doing. And uh, she ended up getting second in that show. She had never lifted a weight. She wow. even started working out. Yet. And uh, she's like, you know, this is something I could probably do. She starts working out. And she literally never loses another show until the 94 Olympia. Yeah, that's... I, I remember, I remember the first time I ever saw you, this was my first fondest memory of meeting you, was when she got second to Laura Cravel and you went nuts. Yeah. I remember you <laughs> jumped up in the audience. I was just a kid sitting in, right. the, the, in, the, in the cheap seats watching the Arnold Classic in awe, and I remember you were pissed off, pissed. and you got up, and you stormed out of there, and I was like, who's that? And I was like, well, that's Kim's husband. That's the yeah. first time I saw you. And the funny thing was, my mom was actually more pissed than I was. She was sitting behind me. <laughs> she, I think she stormed out before I did. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't see the mom. I saw you. You were a big dude when you got up. It was obvious. And everybody in the arena, the judges turned around. Yeah, it was a sight to see. Um, okay, I'm just going to keep pouncing through these questions. You actually answered a whole okay. bunch of questions I was going to ask anyway. But when do you think, when was it that you said to yourself, okay, I'm starting to understand the science of bodybuilding now? When was that? 
So probably like really like I was learning through the whole process and learning, 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 learning. But I think it wasn't until about probably ninety six okay. that like I, I I had already had some success obviously with Kim, but I was you know I was with her all the time. But in ninety six I I was like I understand where this is headed now. Like it was that point where you know I I said. Like I can literally, you know, do some things that have never been done before. Right. And, you know, that was when like we are I already had a you know a relationship with um Nasser and, and all of these guys through um Weeder, right? right? And uh so I knew all these people. Paul turned pro with Kim at the North Americans and all this stuff and started talking to these guys and just started kind of carrying over as far as, you know, just little things, little things, little things. And then it, I remember Nasser in 97 saying, like, listen, I want you to just do everything. I want you to control everything. And literally at about the same time, Dillard did the same thing. Like, he's like, listen, why don't you just take over everything? And so that was probably the first time when I felt, like, 100% comfortable. Like, like I knew what I was doing, and I was so confident in what I could do with the body that, it, you know, I knew that, like, I was on to something as okay, far as, like, so let me being able there. to push so 96, the nutrition. Right, so 96, 97. All right, so then yep. that's when I started to, I mean, the whole world started to basically look towards your direction because, and I wrote this down, you had the Fab Five. You had Ronnie, Nasser, Chris, Flex, and Paul. We're talking yep. five Hall of Famers, five legends of the sport, and they were all under your wing. And I remember that... Everyone, and I'm not going to bring up his name yet. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. But everyone thought you were giving uh, everyone plasma expanders. Right. You were the, the first guy that came along and said, no, no, it's food. It all exactly. comes down to food. That's, and you know what, Chad? I've been preaching this over and over and over again to these kids, especially to the kids like in the Middle East that believe it's all right. drugs. They just think it's all right. drugs. And, I, and, right, I know right. and I'm like, look, guys, it's food. And please explain, just a little bit elaborate on the food aspect of what you were teaching the Fad Five when you met them. So one of the things that I did, and I, I, like I said, I've been around these guys for years, okay? So we had all kind of come in together. Um, Kim and Flex won the Arnold uh, the very first, that you know, together right. um, in 93. And... Um, so we knew we'd travel around. We'd guess what we knew. So I had seen the patterns of these guys, and what they did was even even the ones that had trouble dieting. Okay, they became very regimented in when it came contest time. You know, they was very regimented. They you know even when they would cheat on their diet, they had this amazing ability to almost starve themselves to get back to where they were. What they didn't have the ability to do was stay consistent in the off season. Right, and that was one of the points when I sat down, you know, with Nasser, and, and I mean, Nasser was a huge eater. He was a very consistent guy. But when I started looking at all of the stuff that he was doing, I was like, look, like, and there was a lot of different things that we changed. But I said, one of the things though is like you're eating, but you will eat consistently, at, you know, for so day, so many days, and then you stop. And Paul was even worse because Paul was not a big eater. Right. You know, Paul was this monstrous guy who literally in the off season was eating three meals a day. If that. And you know what I mean? And and you, I mean, you've been around. You've seen him in the off, right? And so, uh, you know, when I started laying out this food and I was like, look, you guys go in the gym, you do all of these types of things, and you're literally never moving forward. Mm. Like, you're not moving forward because your body is in a rut. It goes right back to where it was. And, you know, I remember, and same thing with, you know, uh, Porter Cottrell. I remember sitting down with Porter Cottrell at a guest pose, and he's like, man, I put on 25 pounds of muscle last year, and I competed at the exact same weight. And he goes, I don't, I don't understand how that's even possible. And I said, well, what diet did you follow? And he goes, I followed the exact same one that I always do. And I go, that's your problem. That's the problem. I go, yeah. it doesn't matter how many, it doesn't matter how much weight you put on, your body will still go right back to where it was. Right. And so that was probably one of the biggest things that I did for these guys is changed everything in the off season, made everything very, very, you know, consistent in the off season. But then you have to be able to take that and adapt it to the diet. And one of the things I flip you guys. You can't keep doing the same thing. If it worked one time, that's great. But next year, you put on X amount of tissue. You're a year older. You're like your body is functioning different. So we literally have to adapt to that. We have to change that, and that's going to mean different 
foods, different meals, different, like, it's, you're never going to be able to do the exact same thing that you did the year before. But those were probably the main things. But honestly, it wasn't so much the contest. It was the, it was the off season. The off season. Like, yes. It was always the off season. And even to this day, like, I will, like, always, like, these guys will contact me and I'll be like, listen, the off season is where everything is done. It's where all the, you know, work is done. It's going to be the hardest thing for you. And they're like, I have a huge appetite. And I'm like, yeah, but can you do that every single day? I could eat as much as you tell me. And four days later, they're like, holy shit, I can't, yeah, I can't eat this it. much food. <laughs> yeah. I can't eat this much. And yeah. it is really probably the single one thing that is – holding majority of athletes back in my opinion it's food well which leads us to the next one which because is how you and i met and it was at the 1997 nationals and I, my girlfriend at the time bethany i'm sure you remember her she yeah, said there, there, he, there he is go talk to him go talk to him and i had just walked off the stage and i had gotten seventh in the heavyweight class of the nationals and i walked up to you at the expo and i introduced myself and you were as always in a hurry Trying to go somewhere and do something. Right. And then uh, Kim was with you too. And then um, I introduced myself and then you said to me, and I've said the story a thousand times, but I'm glad I got the, the actual man here to confirm it. You said, yeah, you look pretty good. You know, you're, you're real good. You still got some ways to go. Why don't you show up at the Arnold at 300 pounds and we'll talk. And when right. you said that to me, you did exactly what you just described. You wanted to test me to see if I can have that off-season capability right. to eat that food. And what did I do? I showed up at the Arnold Classic with the legendary white spandex and the white tank top. And you right, right. saw me at the Europa booth. And I remember how you looked at me and started laughing and saying, oh, my God, he actually <laughs> came here. Right. At the and I, remember, I remember seeing you on stage and, and thinking, like, Dude, this guy could actually be good, but he's missing about 3,000 calories. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I did. And, and, and to, to all the kids out there, this was, this was accomplished. This 300, that was actually 308, just to be exact. Yeah. I, I did this through food. It was all about the food. I, I, I ate so much, and I, and I listened, and I went to, to guest posing appearances. I listened to other pros, especially up here in New York when I was listening to Palumbo speak one time at a dinner we were all sitting at after a guest posing. And again, it was the food, the food, the food. So yeah. um, that's how I met, and we actually got together. We got third at the Nationals yeah. the year after, and when everybody thought that I should have actually been second, but that's okay because we knew in 99 what we were going to do. And, of course, my luck for the 99 yep. Nationals, a goddamn tornado hurricane goes through your hometown, your flight gets canceled, and you don't make it down no, to Florida. Remember, I was literally, if you remember, I was, so Kim was filming the cell. That's and right. That's so what <laughs> happened was I flew, and there was like a, there was, I remember there was a storm there, and I got rerouted from like Atlanta to Pittsburgh. <laughs> So, like on U.S. Air or something, and so I'm like stranded in Pittsburgh, and I'm literally no, there's no way for to to get into the show, and because um, it was in no New York, FaceTime, right? there is no none. Of, it was a Nothing telephone. At he called, dude. Me. I got literally like a little tiny like BS Nokia yeah, phone, little like. Nokia phones, and you called me and you said to calm the f down. Everything's <laughs> perfect. I've we've seen the Polaroids. You're, you're fine. Go do what you got to do, and we got it. And, of course, we went. We won the Nationals, and it was beautiful and all that stuff. Um, okay, speaking of the Nationals, we're going to not take this, the subject off of that and get to the, the good stuff that the kids, you know, all the, the legendary stories. Tell the story of the apple pie filling and what it was all about. So the apple pie filling is actually kind of funny, right? <laughs> so we started using this, and I actually – kind of stumbled onto the apple pie filling like miraculously right so <laughs> it was so funny so i worked for a little short period of time at a at a plant called ae staley's and they produced a lot of basically dextrose type products and literally i was a kid i was young like working um during this time at a janitorial service who had a contractor i was a supervisor there and i worked there and just worked in the research area not in research, just basically cleaning everything, right? Because I was young. And so they they had this dextrose product that was like a high molecular dextrose. And so I, we, I used to take like just 
tons of this stuff. And when I was young, like growing, like I was like I would put this on everything. And you would go into the gym and like literally everybody I trained with, I brought it to them and like we were putting this on everything. <laughs> so like when we started in with the athletes, I was sitting there thinking like you know. And so at the time, I was always kind of this like guy that kind of would throw you out in left field, but then not really give you what the hell was going on, right? Right. And so I I knew that this dextrose was in a just one apple pie filling. Right. There was just one brand right, of correct. this apple pie filling. And it was, they used this dextrose in, and it was so basically it didn't have anything to do with the apples. It was the gelatin basically in the apple pie filling. And so we started using this to carb load on before the, you know, before the show. Oh, yes. So then it just kind of just snowballs and snowballs and snowballs and everything becomes apple pie filling. And then everybody's talking like, oh, it's like it's fructose and it's not good for you. And it's like this and blah, blah, blah. And of course, I'm like throwing like curveballs here and there because I don't, you know, I don't really want anybody to, to know what, you know, what it was. And I remember like, you know, never like, you know, never really having to worry about it. And then I remember Melvin like comes back from one of the shows. I don't even remember what show it is. And he's like, man, I'm looking so forward to this. I got like blueberry and cherry and peach, and I'm like, uh, that's awesome, dude. But we can only use the apple. <laughs> only the <laughs> apple pie. I, I made the that same apple, mistake. And milk was so pissed. I did the same thing. I had. Um, I remember you came into my room and you saw all the cherry pie fillings. You're yeah, like, exactly. King, you got to dump all the cherry pie filling, man. Yeah, yeah. It's the apple. I'm like, damn it, man. I was looking forward to the goddamn cherries, man. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, and, and like, they would catch us. I remember all these judges at the. Mandalay Bay, and, and we're, as we're checking in, and they're put, they're hunting us down. What's with the apple pie filling? What's Chad putting in the apple pie filling? And I'm like, guys, uh, it's just apple pie filling. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Everyone <laughs> thought that you had some type of some magic potion that you were giving us, but it was no. It was just yeah. apple pie filling. It's funny. And then what happened was we literally went away from it because they switched it. Yeah. So they switched that like whatever the you know the formula of it and they stopped using that like dextrose like brand and um it's funny like i talked to um brent swanson who is from my hometown of um decatur and he has a best friend that literally works i think the i think the company is actually i think it's owned by adm right now mm. but he works in that same research building so they have all of those records and i was like dude you gotta get a hold of that guy and see if he can like reproduce that dextrose right because that shit was amazing yeah it was uh, it was amazing and, and let's clarify <laughs> one myth right now while i have you here so so the, these kids can understand there's this there's this legendary myth chad that uh, gh is what gave everybody distended guts can you please clarify to these kids that it was the amount of food that we were eating yeah. It, it's, it was, it was like, to there's no the doubt. Like, I mean, what ended up happening was you got to realize during this time is when the sport really progressed, right? And everything moved forward and moved forward and moved forward. And it was one of the things that literally led me to like find different possible ways to carb load because everybody was eating so much food. And look, at the end of the day, the body is only going to go so far and the rest of it has to be forced. You have to force the body to go beyond that. So, you know, you know, can you say that, yeah, you know, some of the supplements and stuff contributed to water retention through there? Yeah. But at the end of the day, that like, listen, if you're eating a normal amount of food, you, I don't know anybody who, you know, they could have taken 16 IU of growth hormone a day. If they're eating a normal amount of food, they're not going to have a distended. No.